Hi, my name is Kenneth Jones. I'm a peer counselor and a licensed CSAC A. I am about to present to you what we call in the field of psychology and addiction, an addiction module. An addiction module is just a breakdown and explanation of what addiction is and what it does to our lives. I personally do not differentiate between, say, alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, food, yada, yada, yada. Addiction is addiction, as you will see in this module. What we know about addiction is one, it's fatal. A lot of people have died from this disease and a lot of people will die from this disease. About 200 people per day in the United States die or incarcerated or injured because of this disease. We also know that it's incurable, but it is treatable. So we can live with this disease just like a lot of other diseases, bipolar, diabetes, and other incurable diseases. We also know that it's insidious, which simply means it's sneaky, treacherous, deceitful, cunning, and baffling. We also know it is progressive, which means the longer we mess with it, the worse it gets. I'll get back to that in a second. Recent studies have shown that the disease of addiction can be genetic, which means we could have inherited traits of it from our moms, dads, grandparents, or somewhere down the bloodline. Characteristics of this disease are obsession, which is that fixed idea or thought. Compulsion, which is the act. Once we start, it's kind of hard to stop in and of our own free will. Impulsivity, which simply means we lose the ability to consider consequences or effects. And that is not to say that we don't think about finances, legal, health, family, but that thought alone is not enough to make us stop doing what we're doing once we get started. The core of the disease of addiction is self-centered fears. Self-centered fears is directly related to our sense of self-preservation. Every living creature has a sense of self-preservation. For us people, our sense of self-preservation is usually tied into three ideas. Our ideas of happiness, safety, and security. And anything that threatens any parts of that, we instinctively do what we have to do to cope with that threat. Those threats tend to happen in life. We'll just call them life events and they continue to happen for as long as we're alive. Things like disappointment, fear, rejection, abandonment. When they happen, we have these emotional responses to those threats. Our emotions have a tendency to escalate. So we go from frustrated to angry, lonely, sad, hurt, abandonment, guilt, shame, isolation, degradation. At the top of that scale is an emotion called apathy. Apathy is where we stop processing these emotions. However, life events continue to happen, and when they do, we quickly go from zero to 80, and we stop processing these emotions, and we start this little personality. So, back in the mid-1800s, there was this doctor. His name was Pavlov. Pavlov was one of the pioneers of addiction and psychology. He did a little study with a bell and some food and a dog and he discovered this thing he called classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is something that starts to happen in all of our lives from the moments we're able to see and recall what's happening around us. The things we see, these events, become triggers. When they happen, we feel some kind of way. When we feel that way, we respond with some kind of behavior. We start doing this as early as three, four, five years old. 
So by the time we're, say, teenagers or early adulthood, we've become conditioned to seeing, feeling, and responding, right? There was another doctor. His name was Sigmund Freud in the early 1900s. Freud did another study similar to Pavlov's, without the bell and the food, of course, um, and he discovered what he called the five stages of psychological development. Those five stages are zero to 18 months is the oral stage, and this is where babies are mostly concerned with oral fixation, the nipple, the bottle, the spoon. 18 months to three years is the anal stage, and this is where we as people get our first introduction to controlling, right? Body demands, potty training, and that sort of stuff. Three to six is called the follic stage. And this is where we start to see and notice things. One of the first things we see and notice is mom and dad, or whoever's representing mom and dad. So, little boys start to gravitate towards their mother because they know or they start to see that mom's a little different and they start asking those questions. Little girls do the same thing with their fathers. Six to 12 is called the latency stage. And this is where all that curiosity just kind of goes dormant for a little while. We no longer care why there's a gender difference. We just want to go and play. Boys say girls have the cooties, and girls say boys are from Jupiter. 12 to 18 is the genital stage. And this is where we develop some type of sexual maturity. And we decide to be whatever it is we're going to be, homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual, etc. Sigmund Freud's theory was this. One of the reasons why people develop issues later in life is because something or some things happen during these stages of their development. Whatever that thing or those things were, while that individual was thinking about how to cope with it, that fixation and that thought process helped develop a part of their personality. Whatever they did to help bring them a sense of happiness, safety, and security, if it worked for them, they continued to do those kind of things and it helped develop a part of their personality. This personality, sometimes called OCD or obsessive compulsive, for most people who suffer from that disorder, they tend to be micromanagers. And if any parts of their day gets unorganized, they kind of get out of fixed. But for people who suffer from the disease of addiction, this kind of personality tends to surround whatever their thing of choice happens to be, drugs, gambling, sex, food, etc. When we're in that mindset of doing whatever it is we do for the sake of our happiness, safety, and security, a little part of the brain kicks in, the primal part of the brain, the fight or flight part of the brain kicks in, and we tend to do these things for the sake of our self-preservation and our consideration for outside matters just takes a back seat. These two doctors I use in this module because they were some of the pioneers on psychology and addiction and they make perfect sense as far as my experience goes. When I was a six-year-old kid my mom died from diabetes during the follic stage of my life. My father was an alcoholic and I have nine brothers and sisters. So my household was chaotic. Back when this happened in the early 1970s, the busing laws were changing here in the state of Virginia. So the neighborhood was kind of chaotic and the school systems were chaotic as well. So as a six-year-old kid on my way to foster home, my sense of self-preservation was being threatened all the time, everywhere. The things I did to help me cope with that was this. Isolation, hiding, withdrawal. And these are known as maladaptive coping skills. Maladaptive means they're not solutions. They don't solve or fix any problems. It also means that the more we use them, the more complex they become. These three maladaptive coping skills are also known as the seeds of addiction. So, by the time I was 12, these things became more complex, like manipulation, lying, cheating, 
and occasional stealing. By the time I would say 15 to 18, I'm experimenting with drugs, alcohol, sex, food, gambling, risk-taking, shopping, shoplifting, working, rage, depression, sports, attention-seeking, attention deficit, hyperactivity, and fighting. By the time I'm 18 and on my way out into the real world, college, military, workforce, I don't feel real confident about my ability to do anything well. Between this low self-esteem, I start to develop these insecurities about my person. Little secrets about me that I'm not so willing to share with people because I don't want to be embarrassed, I don't want to be shamed, I don't want to be ostracized or teased. So I keep these things to myself. Between my low self-esteem and my insecurities, I start to develop this negative outlook towards life. My negative outlook includes things like the attitude of me against the world, poor me, and something, somebody, somewhere owes me something. It also looks like this. Real self versus ideal self. Real self is this guy. Ideal self is the guy I think my parents want me to be, or the guy I think my teammates want me to be, or the guy I think my girl wants me to be. If there is a huge gap between who I really am and who I think people want me to be, it creates what we call an incongruency. The incongruency looks and feels like this. Anxiety, fear, discomfort. The discomfort covers things like rage and depression and everything in between. These three things go to prove that maladaptive coping doesn't really solve anything because back when I started all that I was just a scared little six-year-old. Twelve years later I'm an adult, I'm still scared, I now have anxiety and bouts of depression and rage. Another characteristic of the disease however is denial. Denial is where we start to become our own worst enemies. Denial looks like this. This is our brain, and our brain is made up of four major areas where we think from. The frontal cortex here is responsible for our logic, rational thought, our memory skills, our learning capacity, empathy, and compassion, things like consideration. This part of the brain is responsible for our mechanical stuff like walking and running and sports. This part of the brain controls our senses like sight, smell, taste, and hearing. This part of the brain, called the tempora, sometimes called the primal or midbrain, is responsible for pleasure and survival. The dangerous thing about the midbrain is this. If we do a lot of thinking from that particular part of the brain, which we do, it supersedes logic and rational thought. So, the frontal cortex has a brain wave that looks like this. Doctors call that a normal brain wave. The midbrain, primal brain, has a brain wave that looks like this. And we call it adrenaline. Doctors call it an irregular release of dopamine. Dopamine is a natural biological chemical that kicks in whenever we need it to, whether it's for pleasure or survival. When it kicks in naturally, we have this functioning going on right there. That functioning is our cognitive ability to deal with life situations from this part of the brain. So we think faster, we respond better, we have a better judgment, a better discernment, better empathy, better compassion, better pain management. But when we abuse this process with one of these things, we destroy that functioning. And this is the damage we do to the brain. For some people, that damage is irreparable. But the brain is a very magnificent organ, and it finds a way, no matter how much damage we've done, it finds a way to create a whole nother path to recreate this functioning. 
That's the damage we do to the brain. The other thing we do is this. We create a dependency for just that brain wave. So the stuff we used to do over here now feels like boredom, complacency, and monotony. And that threatens my sense of happiness, safety, and security. So I want to do things that create this excitement or this feeling or illusion of euphoria. So when I'm high, I'm there. When I'm not high, my brain wave does this because now it's searching for that. When I'm not high, this little process magnifies these things. Not to mention DTs, tremors, hallucinations, irritation, agitation, low tolerance, no patience. So when I'm experiencing any parts of that, I go from zero to 80 which means I'm now in a state of apathy and I don't care. I just want to do whatever I have to do to get back there. So the things that I say to myself in order to maintain this becomes a bunch of rationalizations, justifications, intellectualizations, whatever defense mechanisms I use, joking, laughing, playing, avoiding anger, um, black and white thinking, awfulizing, catastrophizing, all that stuff is just a bunch of lies. But that's what denial looks like, and that's what's happening in the brain. Those lies help us to do this. Using looks like any one of these things. Using, however, is just a small part of the problem. It's just a symptom of a much larger problem. The much larger problem is everything before that. These things tend to dictate our behaviors, our attitudes and our outlook. These things all dictated by those lies, by the interpersonal conflict and the personality disorder. And it's all being driven by those fears. These things, we've been cultivating them since way back when long before we discovered our thing of choice. So these things I've come to trust. I've come to rely on them to help me get through life's situations. The effect that this has on us as human beings. As human being, I am physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. The spiritual part of me doesn't really have anything to do with church or religion. It's about connectivity, consciousness, and awareness through which I develop some sense of moral value or choose to practice some type of religion or spirituality. Physically, I've gone out and I've created this dependency, starting with the brain wave. As that spills over into my organs, liver, kidney, heart, pancreas, stomach, blood pressure, heart rate, nervous system, my entire body starts to depend on that same thing. Over time, that dependency starts to take a wear and tear on my organs. Emotionally, I'm so busy trying to create some sense of euphoria or some sense of well-being, happiness, safety, and security, that over time, anything that doesn't look or feel like that I put it down here in the pile of apathy. All the while, I'm disconnecting from the space in between those two places. That space represents the rest of my emotions. As I become more and more emotionally disconnected, I lose the ability to see reality for what it actually is. And so I start to see it more and more like that. Mentally. Whenever I decided to do these kind of things on a regular basis, whether it was 15, 18, 22, 24, whenever I decided to do those kind of things on a regular basis, if I've been doing them for the past five or 10 years, say I'm now 30 years old, that means I'm a 30 year old with the mentality of an 18 or 22 year old, which means that I've now started to impede or block my mental maturity process. And that's not to say that I don't know how to behave or how to respond appropriately. It just means that on most occasions, I'm only thinking about that guy, how I feel and how I want to feel. 
So from the outside looking in, it looks like total selfishness or self-centeredness or immaturity. Spiritually, long time in this process, I realized a lot of what I was doing was wrong. And that's why I manipulate, lie, and hide it because I already know it's wrong. Yet, every time I choose to participate in this kind of stuff, I create guilt, shame, regret, remorse, hurt, abandonment, loneliness, rejection, dereliction, and now I'm throwing this part of me out the window. The four things that make us human is like four tires on a car. So in order for a person to have balance or smooth sailing, they have to take care of their entire self. If a person does these things on a regular basis and they're throwing that part of themselves out the window, they create an imbalance. That imbalance feels like this and it becomes one of those things, which we treat like this. So the way we treat this imbalance is the very same thing that created the imbalance. And the more we treat, treat it like this, the more damage it does. So now my four tires have three flats. That journey is almost impossible. And it looks like this. This is what I call the cycle of addiction. Addiction, by my definition, because there is no universally accepted definition of the word addiction according to the DSM-5, addiction, by my definition, is this, an endless cycle of self-centered routines that leads nowhere except for physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual decay. So, whatever gets a person off this cycle, whether it's a family intervention or police intervention or psychological bottom or breakdown, whatever gets a person off that cycle, I call it the grace of God. Because 200 plus people per day in the United States don't make it. When this happens, that individual gets an opportunity to go somewhere, hopefully, and find out exactly what's going on and find out what the solution is to this incurable disease. That solution is called recovery. There are several different forms of recovery. The 12 step process is the most successful and the oldest form of recovery known to man. But there are several different forms of recovery. Whatever form of recovery you choose, understand that recovery is a process a lifelong process. It helps us put down these maladaptive coping skills so that we can work on these things. As we work on these things and put away the hurtful stuff and nurture the helpful stuff, we start to fix those flat tires. And now we're on a journey that's going to help us live productive lives. Thank you for your time.